Okay, well, I'm going to be talking about cockroaches as potential um, vectors of pathogens. And we've already heard a lot so far about pests, um, you know, pests living in the middle of sub-Saharan Africa in, in tents. It's um, not uncommon to think about pests in urban settings. Um, and we have a huge host of different pests that are associated with humans. Um, and some of these pests we classify just as being nuisances. Um, there can be things that can be nuisances like stink bugs, which don't actually cause a serious problem for humans, but when you try and squish them or if they aggregate in your home, um, it can be unpleasant. Um, they can also cause economic damages, um, which is what we see in the cases of termites. Um, but then we have this other suite of pests that are associated with humans that are actually vectors of disease. And pests are big business. So um, when we think about, about the, just within the United States alone, um, this is an over $10 billion industry. Um, so it's, it's, pests are a big part of our kind of cultural um, society, but it's also a big part of our commerce. And in general, one would argue, cockroaches are unwelcome guests. Even for my lab, we study cockroaches, we work on cockroaches, we go out to try and collect cockroaches, but we don't necessarily want pest cockroaches in, you know, eating our cookies while we're having our, our lab meeting. Um, we have different ways that we can try and assess how many cockroaches are present in, in a dwelling. One way is using something like a sticky trap. A sticky trap is placed in a dwelling, and it usually represents about 2% of the population that's living um, in the dwelling at any one time. A survey of urban homes in the Northeast suggested that about 78 to 98% had some level of infestation of cockroaches. Um, and the reason why this is important is because in addition to being a nuisance of having cockroaches in your home, they can vector disease, but also they can trigger asthmatic responses. They can tr trigger allergic responses. Um, and so for that reason, a lot of people who study asthma are interested in figuring out how many cockroaches are present in people's homes at any one time. And a current average estimate right now for urban areas is that for houses and apartments that are infested with cockroaches, they have between 900 to over 300,000 individual roaches in a home at a given time. And the reason why this is a problem is because whether or not you use RAID or, or your, your, your super you know, comes in and sprays with some other type of insecticide, usually what happens is either you have cockroaches alive in your home or you've sprayed, the cockroaches die in your home and remain there. And cockroach fecal matter that was present, um, as well as decaying parts of cockroaches, um, can become um, airborne and can actually be breathed in, um, and that can trigger as an asthmatic response or some type of allergic response. And we have identified specific allergens that are associated with certain cockroaches, like BLAG1, which is an allergen associated with, with Blatella germanica, the German cockroach. Um, and it's present when people sample um, kitchen dust and, and in dust where in food areas is, it tends to be found, and, and it's really quite common. So the way that cockroaches usually arrive into homes is um, by transportation by humans. Um, we can carry them to and from. I, when I worked at the American Museum of Natural History, that place is really infested with cockroaches, and we would often find them crawling out of our bags when we, when we got home, or sometimes they would crawl out um, from my bag while I was still on New Jersey Transit. Um, they can also arrive just by natural movement. I mean, cockroaches in general are good dispersers, and if we have any structural damage in the home, which we often find, um, then they can crawl in through structural damage. There are specific species of cockroaches that are specialists in kind of living in drains, and they can crawl up through the drains and, and into the home that way. They can also be transported within um, appliances, within microscopes in a scientific setting, within an academic setting. That's not a place where you find cockroaches, but also in stoves and refrigerators and freezers. Um, they can live in the cracks and then, and then be transported that way. Some things that make homes attractive for cockroaches um, are squalor. And what you define as squalor can, can vary, right? There can be extreme cases of squalor, but even just you know, having food items or grease um, left on the stovetop, um, small amounts of food items and debris can allow cockroaches to thrive. Cockroaches can live for long periods of time without moisture and food. Um, so even if this is infrequent squalor, it can make a home uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. As well as having general kind of debris and, and, and clutter um, can make it so that there's lots of kind of habitat structure for these populations to thrive. 
So as far as we know, cockroaches and humans have a really closest have been closely associated for quite a while. In biblical texts, there's lots of references to cockroaches, um, you know, occurring in dwellings and homes. Um, we have kind of a cultural visceral reaction that's negative in terms of cockroaches, which might suggest that this has been around for for quite a while. We know that things like Paraplaneta americana, which is the American cockroach, um, has been infesting Britain from the literature from the 1800s. Um, and we know that it was in America by the early 1600s. So we think that there were probably cockroaches on the Mayflower. And when the Mayflower arrived here, so did Paraplaneta. Um, and you know, there's lots of different species. I'm going to talk about a bit about that in just a second. Um, but there were species of cockroaches that came over with the first settlers. African cockroaches, Paraplaneta americana, is actually not native to here. It's native to, to parts of Africa. And we believe that that came over um, with the transatlantic slave trade. Um, in the, one of our first uh, kind of European settlements, Captain John Smith wrote about the cockroach, um, which was infesting food chests and, and clothing chests. Um, and we know that probably to be based on descriptions, Paraplaneta americana. Um, you know, other people in, in kind of early American literature um, and British literature, you know, discussed various filthy uh, pests that were associated with, with food and clothing items, probably cockroaches. As an aside, this is the person that was Little Miss Muffet was written about, probably. So, but there's not just one type of cockroach. Often when we think about cockroaches, we kind of group them all under the, the name cockroach, but there actually are probably closer to 4,500 4, different species of cockroaches. Recently, termites have kind of been lumped in together with cockroaches, so that actually brings up the number to be, to be a bit higher. Um, but most of the cockroaches that are out there are not pests, right? So about 2% of cockroaches are pests. The rest are, you know, living their life um, as regular producers um, in, in kind of the, in, the, in the food web. So not all cockroaches are bad. The majority of cockroaches um, exist either in forest, jungle settings, um, and what they're doing is they're consuming dead or decaying organic material. Without cockroaches, and we see areas, there are parts of the world where there are very few cockroaches and termites, like um, northern Scandinavia, for example, and it takes a lot longer for wood to be um, removed from the system, for cellulose to be broken down. Part of why we see that is thanks to cockroaches. In addition, there are cockroaches that do other remarkable things. There are you know, occasional examples of species that do things like pollination, which we would consider to be an ecosystem service, something that, that is beneficial to humans. So within North America alone, we have 69 different species of cockroach. Um, the majority of the ones that we, are so, that we kind of think of as nasty pests are things like the German cockroach, uh, the brown banded cockroach, the American cockroach. As an aside, the name of what these, the common name of these cockroaches usually is associated with whomever was, whatever cultural group was seen as negative at the time when that cockroach was first becoming a pest problem. So the German cockroach is called the German cockroach here, but in Germany, that same species exists, we'll tell Germanica, and it's not called the German cockroach. I think it's called the Polish cockroach. Um, <laughs> so there's different names depending on, the common name kind of varies, and it has, there's probably a cultural significance for each of these. There would be an interesting topic for another day. But why are some cockroaches good vectors of disease? Part of this has to do with the fact that cockroaches have a waxy cuticle, um, and they have a sticky kind of oily coating. And that allows different pathogens to become stuck to the surface of cockroaches. In addition, cockroaches tend to, like I said, some cockroaches, Paraplaneta being one of them, likes to inhabit sewers and drains, uh, garbage. Um, and so it's coming in contact with different pathogens that then become stuck to this kind of oily, waxy cuticle. Um, cockroaches are known to be highly mobile, moving from dwelling to dwelling. So then you have the ability to have these pathogens um, transported. And some cockroaches, like Paraplaneta americana, an individual can live four to five years. Right? So they have the ability to transport pathogens. They're moving around, and they can do this over a period of time. Pathogens that we know are associated with cockroaches can be internal, um, or they can be external. Um, in the alimentary canal of cockroaches, there's quite a few different types of pathogens. And people have been you know, making recommendations in terms of public health um, for, for quite a while um, to do basic calming practices, like keeping your house um, very, fairly dry, because cockroaches need humidity in order to reproduce. 
um, and you know, removing your house of, of debris and, and clutter. So in terms of the diseases that are vectored by cockroaches, you would think that we would have a bit more of an understanding of this. But what we have instead are kind of piecemeal studies that have basically gone into, into hospitals or into homes, swapped cockroaches both internally and externally, you know, looking at the elementary canal and looking at their surface, and then just kind of done blast searches um, using you know, genetics to figure out what's, what species are present. Um, and the short list are things like bacillus, things like salmonella, giardia, staph, um, strep, um, we have a, a short list of, of, of diseases that are probably, you know, living on both inside and outside of cockroaches, but the list is probably much longer because this hasn't been done in a systematic or a thorough way. If we, in a study that was done recently in Taiwan, in Taiwanese hospitals, 46.7% of hospitals were infested with cockroaches, and when they looked at the cockroaches, the two um, common ones that were there were Paraphyllina americana and Blotella germanica, the German cockroach, um, and they were infested with, they were infected with various pathogens like the ones that I just discussed. Um, over 33 species of bacteria and 16 species of fungi um, were present living on the cockroaches and inside their elementary canals. Um, of the common ones that we might be most concerned about, things like staph um, and strep, many of these roaches had them inside their guts as well as on the outside surface of their body. And again, these are in clinical and non-clinical areas of the hospital. And as we know, these cockroaches tend to like um, to avoid light. So that means that they often will go inside people's bags and clothing um, to hide. And then that can increase their being, you know, increase these diseases being taken home by patients or by visitors at the hospital. Um, we're not quite sure in urban settings how they, um, how much they are moving. We know that this is true, that cockroaches are able to disperse, but until recently we didn't have a lot of data how much they were dispersing and whether or not, for example, in New York City, we know New York City is infested with cockroaches. Is that one giant population of cockroach or are there multiple individual populations of cockroaches? Do cockroaches cross the Hudson River? Do they cross the East River? Do they go from Staten Island and back? We, up until recently, didn't have a lot of data on this. So Mark Stokel from um, Rockefeller University decided to do a citizen science project um, to kind of ask questions specifically about this. It was called the National Cockroach Project. What they encouraged people to do was if you found a cockroach in your home, you could mail it to them. They would do a barcode, which is a cytochrome oxidase one. It's a mitochondrial gene that's a protein coding gene that is, um, has a hypervariable region that's species specific. It's very good for distinguishing um, variation among populations. Um, and they found out that yes, cockroaches do have neighborhoods. The ones in Brooklyn stayed in Brooklyn. The ones in the Upper East Side stayed in the Upper East Side. The ones in Staten Island stayed in Staten Island. Um, but their sample size was relatively small because it wasn't a funded project. They were kind of funding it on their own. So this project is still ongoing as an aside. Should you find cockroaches, you know, you're encouraged to send it to them. Um, and I can give you his contact information. Plus they have a nice website. Um, and, and they'll fit your cockroach in with the, their kind of neighborhood hypothesis. This has been done in a couple other cities as well. Um, a group, um, including Kobe Shaw's group, and Chris Minidal in North Carolina, they looked at apartment buildings. And they wanted to see how, you know, if cockroaches were moving from apartment building to apartment building. Again, this is important because if cockroaches are, you know, vectoring these pathogens, we need to know how much they're moving and how much, you know, human contact will be, will be associated with this. So for Butella germanica, which is a German cockroach, they looked at cockroaches um, in these various apartment buildings. Each of the apartment buildings is kind of populations is colored in a different circle. And what this um, phylogeny shows us is that cockroaches are moving from dwelling to dwelling, from room to room, and from apartment building to apartment building. So there's a lot of gene flow across, north, across um, the city that they were looking at in, in North Carolina. And they've done this across the United States on a, again, the sample sizes are not, not very large, and it includes the North Carolina study within this. And there seems to be some gene flow between, you know, East Coast and West Coast populations of cockroaches. This could be partially because humans are, are, are moving cockroaches back and forth, but there also could be kind of ancestral phylogenetic history that um, leads there to be shared haplotypes. So we wondered whether in New York City, whether there's some 
you know, proportion of New York City that might have the highest roach infestations. There's common myth, right, that certain parts of, you know, north of 110th Street, then there might be more cockroaches. Um, but whether or not that's true um, was part of an investigation that was taken, a, um, it was done um, a couple of years ago. Um, and what they found was that there was significant variation in terms of race and class in terms of whether or not your house was likely to be infested with cockroaches. And they did this across New York State, um, but specifically um, within New York City, they found that you know, your, what, your kind of socioeconomic class affected whether or not you were going to be having cockroaches in your home. And at first, people were really concerned. What is this? What is the meaning of this? And um, really, what it comes down to is n it's not as simple as this. What it comes down to is it had to do with structural differences in the buildings that people were living in. People tended to aggregate in certain parts of the city, um, and there was structural flaws in certain apartment in certain regions of the city in terms of there being more likely to be cracks. Um, in your home, in your dwelling, um, you know, places for cockroaches to be able to enter. So it wasn't an artifact necessarily of the squalor or debris in certain people's homes, depending on your, you know, kind of your social status. It had more to do with this, you know, kind of structural features of the building that people were living in. So what's disturbing is that people, they also surveyed the amount of pesticide use that was being done by people. So in general, there's two ways that pesticides Humans can be coming into contact with pesticides. That's if your super decides to spray your apartment building. But you can also take it upon yourself and buy your own, you know, combat and raid and start spraying your home. And people, um, there was tended to be that people who were um, kind of in specific areas of the city tended to use more insecticide, more pesticide. So people who were in, in areas where there was higher infestations of cockroaches already are going to be having a health effect. They're exposed to more pathogens and more allergens, but they're also being exposed to more pesticides, right? Because they're using more pesticides to combat this, this problem. So I have a graduate student that I'm working with, and that Dan, this Dan Bunker's graduate student, but he's um, I'm, I'm on his committee, and he wants to look across Newark um, to ask questions about population structure, but specifically to see whether or not there's correlation between certain bacterial um, populations and cockroach populations, and whether or not the cockroaches that are vectoring the bacteria are affecting the movement of bacteria across, across the city. So um, if you have you know, any questions about this, I'm going to do a little advertisement for him. You, know, you can also send him cockroaches, put them in an envelope, and mail them to the biology building. Um, and he'll be sequencing them and kind of swabbing their insides and outsides to see what, what they have living on them. But kind of in conclusion, we don't really know a lot about what the vectors, what the possible diseases are that roaches are vectoring. We have a short list, but it, it probably is much longer. Um, and we need to do more work on this. We know that they've been cohabiting with us throughout our human history, which means that all of the things that are associated with humans are associated with cockroaches, probably. Whenever we've moved, they've moved. So care of Sean Fan, Jessica Ware, or Dan Bunker, you can send your cockroaches or just drop them off in room 206, uh, 195 University Avenue. We've got cockroach traps all over. If you want to have a sticky trap in your office um, here on campus, then we can supply them um, to you. So thanks. And uh, these are, I'd like to acknowledge Dan Bunker, Jean Fan, Dominic Evangelista, and also Lou Sorkin at the American Museum of Natural History, who's working with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.